Morning, in Christ Reality Season 3. In Christ Reality Season 3. I'd like you to open your phone, share the messages, share the videos with all the groups as usual. Let's get this word around the world. Now we're looking at Brother Paul's revelation of identification or the uniqueness of the Pauline revelation. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15, Brother Paul writes to Timothy and he says to Timothy, and that from a child, King James Version, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's very vital because Brother Paul is writing this letter to a bishop, one of his main allies, a son of his in the ministry. And Brother Paul, lay, you know, lays credence um, to the authority of his letters that they were from the scriptures. And of course, you know, when we say the scriptures in this church by now, we're referring to the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. Now, but you see, in John chapter 16, verse 12, Jesus speaking, John chapter 16, verse number 12. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. The Greek says, he will guide you into all of the truth. All of the truth. And Jesus said this towards the last minutes of his life on earth. Before the death, you know, uh, physically speaking. So brother Paul begins to talk about doctrine as a function of persuasion, a function of correction and instruction in righteousness from the Holy Scriptures or from the Old Testament books. And uh, if you observe carefully, brother Peter now begins to give credence to brother Paul's epistles. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So brother Peter picks wisdom, the word Sophia, you know, insight. That is, there's an insight that Paul has. And that insight will be an education. No wonder brother Peter now interestingly uses the word Sophia which he used earlier in 2 Peter 1 6 as cunningly devised fables. The word Sophizo which is the expert use of knowledge in the sense of imagination, creation and suggestion. He says we have not followed cunningly devised, we have not followed Sophizo, expert use of knowledge or skillful writings or the figment of men's imagination. But he now comes and says, Paul's grasp of the scripture is a sophizo or a sophia. That is accurate use or expert use. So he again mentions salvation and Paul says to Timothy, that his doctrine is faith in Christ. Or his doctrine is able to make you wise unto salvation. Which is the word sophizo again. And salvation is the word soteria. That is the study or the concept of saving or being saved or the savior. By using savior and using soteria in the same line. Soteria will be the act of saving or saving act. And we said it has two words. One of them is the word sota, which you are acquainted with in this church because I've done a study, a little bit of study on it. So you can, you can call him the Christ 
And then in salvation, he is not the Christ. So the Sota brings in one of those concepts that Peter calls Paul's wisdom. Because Paul identifies Jesus as a Sota. That again is a mode of explanation of the subject of salvation. Now the word Sota will come from Brother Paul's education as a Roman citizen and as a Jew. Do not forget that language is the use of words. Language is the use of words. And it has many historical meanings and applications at the present age. Now, using the word sota brings in a concept of soteria. A concept that those that were there when Paul was speaking would have understood what he meant. The word sota will be that idea of a Roman conquest. That is a king who conquers a region or conquers a place. So by calling Jesus a sota in that sense, he brings in this very vital concept of salvation. That Jesus will conquer a territory, protect and preserve it. Now I did some exegesis on this in the first service. And I wanted to get the material of the first service to be able to get the details of this foundation because I am just going to shoot from where I stopped in the first service as we proceed in this service. Now remember Peter says that some people because they do not understand what brother Paul taught. They do not understand brother Paul's teaching because brother Paul's knowledge is a hard to be understood. Let me read it again. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto, there's a wisdom, there's a sophizo given to brother Paul. Next verse. Peter is acknowledging that. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So when we say, when Peter said that some people twist those things to their destruction, Let's see a few of those things they twist. One of them will be First Thessalonians chapter 4. Like I said towards the end of the first service, I grew up to believe that the Bible teaches what we call the rapture. You know, this rapture theory from movies and drama and from even some churches we grew up under. The reason why they give you that movie impression of the rapture is a lack of understanding of language and the way things are communicated. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. <clears throat> Let's get to work now. But I will not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. There are some things I mentioned and sometimes it's important to take note. The word asleep. Concerning them which are asleep. Again is a phrase that you will see. Asleep is an idiom. That is why people in today's world we call it rest in peace. R-I-P. Is an idiom Jesus used in John 11, 11. John chapter 11 verse 11. This thing said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I, am, I may awake him out of sleep. So Jesus calls that 
sleep. And brother Paul is using the same phrase concerning them that are asleep. Now that's Lazarus whom Jesus knew by revelation that the guy had died. And Jesus says let's go and wake him out of sleep. So Jesus calls resurrection resurrection waking him out of sleep. Now that's how Jesus talks. Look at his church members, Jesus' immediate audience, his church members, how they reasoned. John eleven twelve to 14. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. It's a good thing now. Let him sleep. Next verse. How be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So you see the use of words. And brother Paul is using the same phrase and you need to imagine the word asleep. For background, remember that Paul never met Jesus in the flesh. Paul never met Jesus one time. They never met at all. So Paul wasn't even there when the resurrection of Lazarus took place. But yet, in the insight and in the sunesis of Paul, he begins to talk about those that sleep. Using the same very word or concept that Jesus used when he was to raise Lazarus. Paul was using that same concept many years after when Jesus' immediate audience couldn't even understand it under Jesus. That means there's an insight about the Pauline theology that even Peter acknowledged because the Pauline theology had the finest details when it comes to communicating concepts, biblical concepts that surround the subject of salvation. Now, I have told you that Jesus' miracles are a sign. Every miracle of Jesus documented is a sign, a revelation of his plan. His miracles are a lesson. His miracles are a lesson. For example, look at John eleven twenty five. 25. In the raising of Lazarus. John eleven twenty five, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he, was, he were dead, yet shall he live. Next verse. Next verse. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So Jesus heals the sick as a pointer to his redemption from sin. So he's about to raise a man from the dead and is going to use that resurrection to point our attention to a more eternal reality. To a more eternal reality. So when he says he is asleep, he is expecting us to understand what happens when saints die. So he says here that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. That means he can only sleep. But he can never die. He can only sleep. But he can never die. That's basically what he's saying. Because if you observe, after he raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus still died. So the point was not the temporal re resurrection of Lazarus. The point was that the resurrection of Lazarus was a pointer to the resurrection of a man from sin to eternal life. 
Am I communicating? So every miracle of Jesus was deliberately documented to point to an eternal reality. Stay with me. But the point is, he therefore changes our vocabulary. Again, let's look at Brother Paul in Acts 13, 36. Brother Paul borrows those words. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Fell on sleep. He borrows those words. When Peter was going to talk about David, look at how Peter will communicate now. Remember, Peter was there in the raising of Lazarus. Okay? Acts 2.29 Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Unto this day. He is both dead and buried. It doesn't mean Peter is a bad student, but that is what he said. Later on, Peter is, Paul is talking, Paul is using sleep. Peter that was there is talking. He's using dead. Paul comes years later. He says sleep it. In 1 Corinthians 7 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband live it. But if her husband be dead... She is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. Brother Paul is talking of a believer who is married and he uses the word dead. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11.30 1 Corinthians 11.30 For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep this is Paul. So that praise, sleep, is for those who believe. First Corinthians chapter 5, I mean chapter 15 verse 6. First Corinthians 15 6. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. Verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Please pay attention. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Look at verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We will see that in a few minutes. Don't forget that Paul's use of Jesus as Lord, Peter also in 2 Peter 3 verse 4, so that we will not be blackmailing Peter. Okay, 2 Peter 3 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He is talking to believers. So the phrase sleep is for believers. Now Paul used these realities in 1 Corinthians 10, 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man of another's. Is the word curious is the Lord. Curious is the Lord. Now remember, Brother Paul was a Roman or a citizen in the Roman Empire under Caesar. And he was mentioning a Lord that was not Caesar. The earth is the Lord's 
and the fullness thereof. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Look at verse 28. 1 Corinthians 10 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, it not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Paul is mentioning the Lord under a Roman empire, another Lord that is not Caesar. He is quoting David when David talks about a kingdom. You need to go to Psalm 24 to see where Paul took his verbiage from. When David is prophesying, he prophesies in Psalm 22 about the sufferings of Christ. Psalm 22. Then Psalm 23, he is a shepherd who gave himself for salvation. Then in Psalm 24, his kingdom. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Be lifted up everlasting doors and let the king of glory come in. So he's talking about his glory. Those Psalms follow one another. From his sufferings, he mentions him as a shepherd of the sheep who brings in his sheepfold as their everlasting shepherd. Then he talks about the everlasting kingdom and he talks about the earth. So he says, the earth is the Lord. Talking about Jesus. So in talking about the kingdom, he does not exclude the earth. The earth is part of God's kingdom. That is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, talking about food offered to idols. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. But to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are in him, and one Lord, Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So now he's referring to food offered to idols. In verse 6, he's talking about the earth, and about food offered to idols. Then in chapter 10, he reinforces it by saying, that don't mind anybody who says that food belongs to idols. The earth is the Lord, including the food therein. No idol owns food. The earth is the Lord, including the food. So that is why if they say food is offered to idol, you can give thanks and eat it. Because no idol owns food. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Teaching good. Now, some very important understanding. He mentions the earth. Keep that somewhere. First Thessalonians 4.13 again. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The word others there is the word laopos. La, la those who are left behind, different from you. Then he brings in a concept in verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Ay, 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 ay. Now, will God bring? Eh? Will God bring with him? The word bring is the word ago, A-G-O, which is to lead. To carry or to bear. Then look at the next verse, 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Please pay attention. We are studying the uniqueness of the Pauline revelation of identification. Shall not prevent them that are asleep. I believe it's a choice of words here by translators. It can be we which remain. It should be those which are alive. Because even Paul is no more here. So he was making reference to those who are alive. And remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that sleep. So the question is, where did the church world get disappearance from? Because so far from what we have read, we have not seen any disappearance. We saw the Lord coming. We didn't see disappearance. Meanwhile, in the church world, when they teach the concept of rapture, is a concept of disappearance. But doctrinally, we can't find it anywhere in the entire Bible. He just said, if those in Christ slept before those who are alive, according to Paul's imagery, if those who are alive now, based on your movies, based on the CRK in churches, if they escape, it just means they added to the number of those who are asleep. But that's not what we're learning here. He uses a word, parousia. Parousia, which is the coming or the presence. Parousia. Now, presence how? Listen carefully. He says, shall not prevent them that are asleep. Prevent is the word to precede. Fat Fateno in the Greek. P-H-T-H-E-N-O. Fateno. You will see the use of that word in Romans 9.31. Romans 9.31. Give me Philippians 3.15 and 16. Philippians 3.15 and 16. Let us therefore... As many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Next verse. Nevertheless, where unto or where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. The word attain. Underline the word attain. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 2 16. Brother Paul. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. That they might be saved. To fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them. To the uttermost. To come upon to come upon. Now let us see what brother Paul will apply. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 and 15. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Will God bring with him? Next verse. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Somebody on that sound is tampering with my audio on the stage shall not prevent them which are asleep. Which are asleep. 
Did you observe and remain unto the presence? Unto the presence. The showing of the Lord. The showing of the Lord. The word curious. Shall not prevent them which are asleep. That is, shall not attain them which are asleep. It simply means that those who are alive will not die. Do you understand? Watch. Those who slept in Christ at the coming of the Lord, those who are alive, the Lord will bring with him those who are asleep. But those who are alive will not sleep. They will not attain sleep like those who slept. But those who slept, the Lord will come with them. Please stay with me. Because we are doing word study to arrive at the understanding of the intent of the Pauline theology on the coming of the Lord. So far, we have not seen a disappearance. We have seen those who slept. The Lord will come with them. Those who are alive and remain will not attain sleep. Teaching good? Now, mm -mm -mm. let's go to 2 Thessalonians 1 7. 2 Thessalonians. 1 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction away. That's the way it is in the original. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Look at verse 10 now. When he shall come. We are not the ones going. He is the one coming. When he shall come. To be glorified. In his saints. And to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Take note of the word revealed. So this coming is the revelation of Jesus in the saints. The second coming is the revelation of Jesus in the saints. It's a revelation. There's nothing in the Pauline epistle that teaches a disappearance. Don't forget he said, they that are asleep. In other words, he is talking about victory over physical death. Sometimes, you need to read these scriptures in Thessalonians with 1 Corinthians 15. He is saying that those who are dead, we will not have to be united with them in death. So it therefore rules out a disappearance from the earth. So here comes the challenge. When he uses an imagery in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, 
and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That is an imagery Paul is using. Don't forget Paul's use of the word Lord which we explored in the first service. The kingdom and the sota. He is using an imagery that the believer of his era when Paul was talking will understand. If Jesus is a king if he's an emperor a ruler a conqueror a sota who conquers a territory defends the territory and preserves the territory. If you are in the first service, you will get all that. Go get the material. Now, so as a sota, he is coming to claim his territory. He won't do it by running away. He will come into the earth because the earth is the Lord. Jesus will not stand in the sky and an angel carry trumpet. Blow your trumpet. Blow your trumpet now. An angel will stand beside Jesus. Then believers that are rapturable. That is Nollywood. That's not Bible. What they did was they interpreted the imagery of Paul as literal. Their problem is this verse. And it's because Paul's letters are hard to be understood. There's an education from which Paul communicates his insight. Where you must calm down to study. Now, still here? Still here? Still here? Okay. So he uses that phrase, or you can call it an imagery of how it was done. He has a territory that is coming to. The word there is the word command. Command. With a shout. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The word shout is the word command. It's not whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, nah, nah. Uh -uh. It's command. Shout is imagery. Remember, he uses the word lordship of Christ. Commandia is the Greek word. That word shout there is the Greek word keluzma. Keluzma. K-E-L-E-U-S-M-A. Keluzma. Shout. It is used to rally your troops. How many of you were in boarding houses because I was in one? When there is supposed to be early morning something in the boarding house, the senior prefect will rally the troops. He may either use a megaphone to say, wake up everybody, let's meet at the assembly grounds. How many of you have been in the army barracks before? When they want to gather the soldiers, the, the command that is issued, you know the soldiers have their own tongues and all soldiers will gather. It's like the Neptune tree girls when they brought all their, 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 their acting team all over the world when they gather in the morning and everybody's busy with their stuff one of them will take the megaphone and make noise with the megaphone and call everybody to assemble. 
So that means the word shout is the word command. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a command. A command to rally together his troop. He's an emperor. He's a ruler. So Paul uses the imagery of conquest. Then he now says, with the voice of an archangel, that's a figure of speech. With the voice of an archangel. The word archangel is the word chef angelos. C-H-E-F-A-G-E-L-L-O-S. Chef Angelos. Chef Angelos. A word used by Jude. That is somebody who is a chief of troops. A chief of troops. Then, with the trump of God. From heaven with a command. With a chief of troops voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Trump is the word say pinks. Say pinks is S-A-I P-I-Q-X. It's used 11 times. Precisely it's used for a gathering. It's a word used to gather. This is figurative of gathering together. You will see the application of that word in Matthew 24, 31 for home studies. Matthew 24, 31 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. A gathering, you want people to come to you. You use the word trump. It is used in the Old Testament also in the figuratives of the ceremonies of the temple. It is to call a gathering and brother Paul repeats the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15.52. 1 Corinthians 15.52 In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. He says... If you observe, Paul doesn't talk about an escape here. He doesn't talk about a disappearing act. None of that in the Bible. Yet yeah, that is what many churches are preaching. Misleading believers. Giving believers a false hope. <laughs> you know. The people are praying, Father, make me rapture him. And in their mind is, give me wings to fly. Many believers believe that when, they, when, they, when, when Jesus will appear in the eastern sky and stand with archangel, Bo! believers will start, paka, paka, paka. Everybody's heading to the sky. Are you a vulture? Eagle Christians. No wonder they call you ego. Those are imageries. You don't interpret imageries literal. Otherwise, you are a Pharisee. There's no difference between you and the Sadducees. Paul doesn't talk about an escape. Paul talks about a gathering. You know, the imagery people assume is someone is driving... He has kept his holiness. Jesus appears in the sky and the angel is standing beside Jesus and blows a trumpet. Nothing like that. 
the voice of an archangel there is an imagery. And then the trump of God is also figurative. It is for a gathering. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18. Hebrews 12 verse 18. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Next verse. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Next verse. For they could not endure that which was commanded. They could not endure that which was commanded. He calls them in the Old Testament, yet they can't come near. That's what he's saying. He calls them, he commands them to gather, yet they cannot come near. A gathering that is fearful is what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. In Revelation 1.10 and then in the book of Revelation, he will say things like, I heard the voice of a trumpet in the spirit. The voice of a trumpet is the gathering of people. The gathering of people. Now back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What is Paul saying? It's a gathering of those who are asleep. And a gathering of those who are awake. That is what the trumpet sounds for. To gather those who are asleep and to assemble those who are awake. And the moment they gather in the sleep, it means more people have slept. Then they must gather awake. Because we are not to attain to their sleep. Even though many people have read this verse and after reading have joined them. But those that will be alive at the day of the Lord will not sleep. The Lord will bring them with him. I'm teaching good. But the point remains, please watch this. Because the one that people's attention is where he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, For we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That word caught up together with them in the clouds. Caught up together with them. Before we talk about clouds, still he didn't say disappear. He said cut up. Now he gave you a background. That word is used in Acts 8, 38. I mean 39. Where Philip was cut up by the spirit and he appeared in Azotus. Acts 8, 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord cut away Philip. That the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. When he was caught up, when Philip was caught up, he didn't disappear. He appeared somewhere else. So caught up is not a disappearance. It's a change of location. Caught up is a change of location. Are you following then look at Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God know it. Verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise. 
So in the catching up is a change of location and had unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So when he uses the same phrase caught up, Paul just talked about a change of location in the spirit. And in this instance, the change is simple. Are you following? The change is we will put on incorruptibility. That's a change. Not that we will disappear. We will put on incorruptibility. That is what he's teaching. And so we have the idea that everybody will disappear. We will find ourselves in a whitish cloud with wings. Paul's wisdom. What Peter recognizes is a Sophia. An insight into something. Jesus has already said. The issue with them is the way Paul communicates Jesus' teaching with such beauty. Watch this now. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Teaching good? 4.17 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Shall be caught up change of location together with them in the clouds. The word clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, a lady left this ministry. A lady left this ministry because I said that the cloud is not sky. She said, Dr. Damina, no, 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 no. I'm leaving the ministry because that is not correct. How can you say there is no physical heaven we are going to? He said, that's all I have believed all my life. And I'm not about to change the position. I said, save Johnny. Ignorance can never intimidate knowledge. I don't know if she has started coming back gradually. You know, when they live like that, they come back through YouTube. They don't come back through Facebook. They come back through YouTube and that thing they were running away from humbling themselves and keeping quiet. You can't be talking when your teacher is talking. See, the first thing you must do in life is observe a man. The day you agree his feet to be your teacher, sit down and shut up and let him do the talking. Don't be talking when I'm talking. You are not the teacher, I'm the teacher. Shut up. And if you think I'm not a good teacher for you, get out. Get out. Go and either teach your own class or get another teacher. But as long as I'm your teacher, you are quiet when I talk. And if you don't understand anything, pray in tongues, come back and look at it again. <laughs> she wants to go to physical heaven. Physical heaven. And Elon Musk has not reached she wants to fly to physical heaven. <laughs> How many of you believe that heaven is a physical place? Is there anybody like that? You are wise, eh? Even if you do, you don't want to raise your hand because I've just finished saying something. <laughs> if heaven is a physical place, let me shock you. Second Peter 3.10 let me shock you a bit before we go back to clouds. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So is that the heaven you are going to? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, If heaven for believers is a physical heaven, it means when it's dissolved, the believers will be homeless. Homeless. 
homeless. <laughs> this physical earth and physical heaven will melt. They will be dissolved. We are called to an inheritance. Incorruptible. Undefiled. That faded not away. Reserved where? In heaven. So if it is this heaven, how can undefiled, uncorruptible be contained in a dissolvable heaven? It doesn't work. Which means the heaven we are talking about for believers is a reality in Christ. It's not a physical location. Now, come back to clouds. Behind the clouds. How many of you are alive then? Not many. Uh -uh. Honey, it looks like there's just about five or six of us here that were alive in the days of behind the clouds. There was a popular national television program called Behind the Clouds. The chief actor was one guy called Nusa. How many of you are alive then? <laughs> Those who are alive are only me. <laughs> wow. There is hope. That means this church is full of young people. That is tomorrow now. I'm very happy. So people are thinking of this rain cloud. We shall go and meet God. Where that is God will come down and sit on the cloud. That is rain cloud will be carrying God. And if the cloud decides to rain, God will have nowhere to sit. <laughs> Every time rain falls, the cloud clears. So God will be hanging. Gather clouds, gather. I need more clouds to sit on. <laughs> Can't you think? <laughs> when we talk about clouds, we're not talking about clouds. Clouds here have nothing to do with rain clouds. Again, it's an imagery. Cloud is the word nephili in the Greek. N-E-P-H-E-L-E. -E, nephili. Nephili. I hope it is not true that the audio online is breaking and the online people are struggling to hear themselves. Ernest, you need to confirm that and check it out. Nephili, which is from the Greek word nephos, N-E-P-H-O-S. Nephili, from the Greek word nephos. Now look at the use of that word. Matthew 17 verse 5. While he yet speak, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When you hear the glory cloud, you are not thinking of something hanging in the sky. Nephili. Look at Acts 1 9. Acts 1 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now you know that there was a story, Matthew tells us in Matthew 26, that the saints which were asleep also rose when Jesus rose. Huh? That fact is very silent, but is there. So this lends credence to it because cloud means gathering. A gathering. That's the meaning of cloud. Nephili. A company. Every time the word cloud is used, a company is involved. So cloud represents company. When they saw Jesus and the cloud was because 
there was a company with Jesus. They saw Jesus with Elijah and Moses. That company with Jesus is called a cloud. Company. That's the meaning of the word cloud. A gathering. So when he says, we shall be with the Lord in the cloud. Cloud represents company. Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews 12, 1. We are foreseeing, we also are compassed about. With so great a cloud of witnesses. So the cloud are witnesses. They are persons. Is a company. Cloud witnesses. So it's a company or a gathering. So when he says, we shall be with the Lord in the cloud, First Thessalonians 4, the Lord in the cloud, he is talking about the gathering with those who are asleep. Those of us alive will gather with those that will come with the Lord who were asleep called a cloud. So quit those movies with Jesus hanging in the sky sitting on top of foamy clouds. When you fly aircraft, you know those clouds in the sky, they are like foam. So Jesus is sitting on top. Is he? What do they call it? A waterbed or mattress. Ah, Jesus is feeling nice. Then something happened, rain started falling. Jesus has no seat again. <laughs> Jesus is hanging. <laughs> Think like spiritual people. Is an image. Now, we will meet the Lord in the air. Very important. The word to meet there is the word appendices. A phrase used for when the sota comes and meets his subjects. They are his. Then he comes. He meets with his territory. Then he unites his entire kingdom. That's the word appendices. It's the welcoming of a noble. The verb is apatau. To welcome a noble. You will see the application in Acts 25, 6. To welcome. What are we welcoming? We are welcoming the Lord in the earth. Not that the Lord is welcoming us into heaven. No, we are welcoming the Lord in the earth. Is the Lord being welcomed in the earth because he is being revealed among those that believe. It is called the manifestation of the sons of God. Teaching good. Yeah. Now, Mm, I tell you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Mark 14, 30, apantao means to welcome. So we welcome the Lord in the air. Air, there is a kingdom, a rule. The word air is atmosphere. A kingdom, a rule, or an atmosphere. In Ephesians 2, 2 it talks about the prince of the power of the air. So there's no disappearance. Then Paul explains it further in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Wherefore comfort yours. I mean 5 from verse 1. Start from verse 1 to the end. Let's read the whole chapter quickly, quickly. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You don't even need me to write unto you. Next verse. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them and as travel upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Are you watching? Whether we wake or sleep, we are for... I'm not writing about this to intimidate you and give you a prayer point. I'm writing it as a comfort. Comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. That is whenever you talk about these realities, it should console you for your faith in Christ. Shouldn't be a prayer point. I pray that at the end of the day you will make it. Make what? Make what? I made it before the journey started. Get out of my face. Get out of my face. So he expatiates what he's saying. So it's not a disappearance. He uses the imagery of a king coming to reclaim his land. So the believer will welcome Christ. What is referred to as the resurrection of the body. So Paul bailed himself out by saying, whether we are awake or asleep. That, that, that means when he said it, he was saying, I may not be alive when it will happen. So he already took care of that. First Corinthians 15, 51. I'm rounding off. Are you blessed? 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Next verse. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We shall be what? Changed. Next verse. For this corruptible must put on what? Incorruption. And this mortal shall, must put on what? Immortality. Next verse. Be fast. We are reading to the end. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not referring to a disappearance. He's not teaching a disappearance. Because in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Next verse. For he had put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that is accepted, which did put all things under him. You can't destroy death by putting him out of use by dying. You can't destroy death by putting him out of use by dying. It's a unity of those who are asleep with those who are alive. Which simply means the earth is the Lord. <laughs> God is not going to destroy the earth because he owns the earth. In the sense of there will be no more earth. 
he will renew the earth. And we will look at that a bit much later in this series. Because in Philippians 3, 20 and 22, Philippians 3, 20 and 22, for our conversation is in heaven right now. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So there's no disappearance. It is only a change of body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. There will be no disappearance. So that's the imagery of the Sota, one coming to claim his territory. And that is how brother Paul explains what he says. You know, Paul uses a lot of Genesis. He brings in Genesis 1, 26, 28 dominion into his teaching. He says the earth is the loss and the earth is also man. Then Paul uses the Genesis man to explain Christ and his kingdom who will claim the earth eventually. So when they say redemption, a redemption will include the earth itself. That's why creation is waiting. Creation is waiting for the manifestation. Because in that manifestation will be the redemption of the planet. I'm teaching. I said I'm teaching. Romans 8, 18. Look at it clearly. Romans 8, 18 and 19. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Next verse. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Paul again is using Genesis. Manifestation here means the full disclosure of the sons of God. So you must learn to look at his language when he paints an imagery. You must always understand brother Paul's imagery by his explanation. The people, the concept of people escaping from the earth didn't come from Paul and it didn't come from Jesus. It's someone who taught it about 500 years ago and it was not doctrinally explained and the church rather stayed with that imagery than with the scriptures. So there's no teaching of escape. People will have the body, they are united with the Lord, and then they meet with their body in a resurrection. That is what Paul is teaching. The dead will rise and we are in corruption. The living will be changed and put on incorruption. Then the dead and the living in incorruption will gather together with Jesus. That's the manifestation of the sons of God. And that is what we call the rapture. It's not escaping to somewhere. Where? The earth is the Lord's. And the Lord of the earth will not abandon his territory and escape somewhere. He will rather occupy his territory with his troops. Zaboda. Zaboda. If you're catching the shout, I hear you. Brother Paul is the only one who gave us the details of this truth. Other writers will just say the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord. But now Paul gives the day an explicit meaning. That that day means that this body will put on incorruption. And that's exactly what Jesus taught at the tomb of Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, shall live. Eternal life. Eternal life eternal life. He will raise them to eternal life. Eternal resurrection. Somebody bless shout a powerful amen. amen. Now, we are still laying the foundation of this series and I'm still going to continue from here tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. GMT plus one. I'm live. But the service begins before 6 and I will tell you when. But I'm saying 6 now for the global audience plus all our campuses. I'm teaching at 6 on the dot. 
I'll teach an hour and we will pray an hour because the fast begins tomorrow evening. Somebody bless, shout glory. glory. Get on your feet, that's all I got for you. Are these concepts becoming clear? Yeah. As a child of God, born of God, the spirit of God in you is the guarantee that your body will be changed. This body will be swallowed up by the other body. Did you hear what I said? And the other body, brother Paul explains this as a cloth. We will wear it. Yes, we will wear the other body. Alright? Corruption shall be swallowed by the incorruptible. Glory to God. When Jesus rose from the dead, did he disappear? Eh? Did Jesus disappear when he rose? What happened? He showed himself alive. And people saw him and touched him. And he is the first fruit of our resurrection. That means the same way he rose is the same way we will rise. If he didn't disappear when he rose, we will not disappear when we rise. He is the prototokos. He is the prototype. Whatever happened to him in his resurrection is what will happen to us in our resurrection. Am I teaching good? That's, what, that's where you belong. And that reality is already inside you. It's just that it will take effect. Because the day you receive Christ, that life came on your inside. Right now, wherever you're standing, what you carry is resurrection life. What is inside you? No, I'm not hearing you at all. What is inside you? Can I hear it powerfully? What is inside you? Because if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelleth where? So what spirit is in you? What spirit raised Christ from the dead? The same spirit that is in you. The spirit is life because of righteousness. So that resurrection life is inside you now. And that life will take effect on the day of resurrection. For those that are dead, it will wake them up. For those of us that are alive, it will change us. And both we that are alive and those that are dead, we will gather together. And Jesus among us will be made manifest. The full parousia of the sons of God. I thought a believer will shout glory in the house. Lift your right hand. Father, I pray for everybody this afternoon. Revelation knowledge is growing big in this house. Revelation knowledge is growing big in the community of the power citizens all over the world. Television, radio, all those that are watching in campuses and around the world. I hear the sound of the foot of soldiers. Soldiers, soldiers that are going in to occupy the territory. I hear the sound of their foot. They are not marching apologetically. They are marching as commanders taking charge of the territory on behalf of the Lord of the territory. Legado, Magada, Legede, Jakada, Ege, Mako, Taka. In the days to come, in the weeks to come, in the months to come, it will get more bold, it will get more effective, it will get more powerful. And these soldiers are stopping at nothing in multiplying themselves. They will go forth and nothing will stop them. Nothing shall stop them. And their sound shall be heard all over the earth. Their sound shall be heard all over the earth. And then they begin to multiply in trickles. They multiply in trickles. They multiply in trickles. And it will look like nothing is happening. But all of a sudden, you turn to the left, they're all over the place. You turn to the right, they're all over the place. You turn to the west, they're all over the place. You turn to the south, they're all over the place. You turn to the west, they're all over the place. You turn to the east, they're all over the place. They are an invading army and they will cover the face of the earth. Say of the Spirit of God, you are part of that move. Therefore, therefore, get up your loins. Get up your loins. Get up your loins. The day is here. When these realities will be effected upon the face of the earth. Men and women who are fearless, men and women who are courageous, 
men and women who are mindful of their divine assignment working on the face of the earth men and women who are fully persuaded men and women who are fully knowledgeable of this assignment occupying places and taking over places and turning men into students and multiplying disciples for the kingdom and all over the earth manifestations manifestations of the glory and of the power and of the presence of God thank you father Thank you, Father. Zekotokoya. And wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, saith God, there's a witness in your heart. There's a witness in your spirit that you're part of this. Therefore, accept responsibility and wake up to the challenge for the time is now. Awake, awake, awake thou that sleepest and accept responsibility to walk in this God-given assignment. And as you obey and walk in it, you will find true joy, true fulfillment, and true satisfaction. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. It is done. And I speak the blessing over you and I speak the grace of Jesus over you. And I declare that you are clothed with strength and clothed with might. Together we will see the glory of God fill the earth as the water covers the sea. In Jesus name we pray. And every believer who receives that prophecy and prayer, shout that amen on a note of finality. Now go ahead and celebrate. You are part of that army. 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 Somebody shout glory. Amen. What time tomorrow?